Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Download, coming to you live from Church Mill headquarters here in the Archdiocese of Detroit. After months of lying and trying to cover up the cover-up, the lie has now been officially disclosed. And along with it, Archbishop Vigano has been vindicated in his claim that McCarrick had been sanctioned, Pope Francis knew about it, and D.C. Cardinal Donald Wuerl, along with many others, were lying shamelessly when they said they did not know. Private official correspondence from McCarrick's former secretary prove that all of this has been one big lie. When Vigano released his earthquake testimony last August, the ripple effects continued for months, eventually resulting in a so-called sex summit this past February in Rome. The result of that summit was a document the Pope issued a couple of weeks back saying essentially the bishops will investigate themselves. In other words, Vigano, who had accused the Pope and assorted cardinals, was proven true. There's no desire to change the established order because it is run by a homosexual current. The last directive from the Pope makes you wonder if that was a motivating factor for McCarrick's former secretary to indeed release all of this now. So today, Christine's going to introduce us to the latest whistleblower, McCarrick's former secretary. Stephen's going to look at the very serious and not really believable issue of Pope Francis being completely in the dark about all of this. And Brad will discuss the snake of a man, Donald Wuerl, who has so far managed to escape serious consequences for his lies. Christine, uh, you know, just as we were all sitting around yesterday saying, wow, we need another thing to break, and all of a sudden two things broke. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah, this was a gift that was dropped into our lap, so God bless Monsignor Anthony Figueredo. He's a new, he's a new whistleblower now. But so this is he's a still man a Francis ally, doesn't want any of this being used against Francis, but mm -hmm. you know, whatever, the point is, here's the proof. Exactly, so what happened was yesterday, Monsignor Anthony Figueredo, who's formal, former personal secretary to Archbishop Theodore McCarrick back when he was in Newark, the Newark uh, Archdiocese in New Jersey. Uh, Figueredo published a whole cache of correspondence from Cardinal McCarrick, stretching all the way back to 2008, proving that Pope Benedict did, did indeed impose penalties on McCarrick, just like Vigano said, totally vindicated Vigano. Not only did it prove that these penalties were imposed restricting his travel, he was not supposed to travel internationally, restricting uh, any public appearances, we also know that Cardinal Donald Wuerl was made amply aware of these. In at least two correspondences, McCarrick made clear, I shared this directly with my archbishop, which was Wuerl at the time. Now, Wuerl, since last year, has been protesting, saying, oh, I didn't know anything about this. He's still protesting that to this day in light of this objective evidence. Um, but it also doesn't That's called make... lying. Called lying, yes. <laughs> uh, but it also, the, the cache of letters also reveal that McCarrick totally ignored the restrictions that he traveled freely under the pontificates of both Pope Benedict and Pope Francis, but they greatly ramped up under Pope Francis, especially his travels to China. That's very significant in light of the Vatican-China Accord. But yesterday, Figueredo went to, on to CBS News and spoke a little bit about the reasons for why he published these letters. Let's take a look. I would be part of the cover-up if I simply kept that correspondence to myself. McCarrick has been defrocked, the ultimate punishment that the church can impose. So what would this change? We're not talking specifically about McCarrick. We're talking about future cases. Perhaps there are other bishops out there who have had restrictions imposed upon them. Uh, this is why this needs to come out. What is it that we fail to do? Who knew what and when? And why were these restrictions not enforced? Restrictions were imposed back in 2008. They followed accusations, allegations, and settled settlements by two dioceses which means there was something serious going on. At the same time, McCarrick was allowed to continue his travels, to meet here in Rome with high-ranking officials, including, you know, the secretaries of state. So, uh, in a letter, 2008, that he published from McCarrick, McCarrick is responding to a letter uh, sent him by Cardinal Ray, where Cardinal Ray 
communicated to him the restrictions that Pope Benedict was placing on him. And these restrictions are directly related, related to McCarrick's practice of sleeping with seminarians. This is what McCarrick said in his 2008 letter, quote, having studied the letter of Cardinal Ray and having shared it with my archbishop, Cardinal Wuerl at the time, Archbishop Wuerl at the time, I pledge again that I shall always try to be a good servant of the church, even if I do not understand its desires in my life. Of course, I am ready to accept the Holy Father's will in my regard. I could find a place to live in one of the parishes of the Archdiocese of Washington. The Archbishop is willing to arrange for that in any area that the Holy See would desire. In summary, in the future, I will make no commitment to accept any public appearances or talks without the express permission of the Apostolic Nuncio or the Holy See itself." Close quote. A few points to note here. At the time, if you all recall, he was living in a seminary with other seminarians. Pope Benedict found this out. He told Cardinal Ray to communicate to McCarrick. He had to move out immediately. This is what he's addressing here. Not only did he share the directives with Archbishop, Cardinal Archbishop Wuerl, he makes very clear that Wuerl was willing to arrange for new living arrangements based on these directives, these penalties imposed by Pope Benedict. So he knew. Um, now, in another letter, McCarrick admits to his habit of sleeping with seminarians, but he tries to rationalize it by saying this, quote, I've always considered my priests and seminarians as part of my family, and just as I have shared a bed with my cousins and uncles and other relatives without thinking of it being wrong, I had done this on occasion when the diocesan summer house was overcrowded. In no case were there minors involved, but men in their 20s and 30s. I've never had sexual relations with anyone, man, woman, or child, nor have I ever sought such acts, close quote. Well, we know he, he was well, lying through his lie. teeth. Oh, he's just lying through his teeth. We know from the testimony of James Grine, who talks about decades of abuse, spiritual and physical abuse at, at the hands of McCarrick, starting when he was 11. 11 years old. You know, and then not just that, but Richard Seip, uh, you know, the late um, psychologist and expert on clerical sex abuse, he published testimony from victims who said they were taken to the Jersey Shore Beach House and they witnessed McCarrick uh, sexually assaulting other people. One of them was actually you know, groped by McCarrick himself. So there are multiple victims in, out there who, I mean, he was just lying through his teeth here. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it's, to, okay. think that, to think that this is, uh, uh, <laughs> you know, you, the more you see of this, the more it just becomes like you're in the twilight zone. It's like you really, do you people, are you ever people really saying this, expecting that yeah. everybody's gonna believe you? I mean, how many men, Unless he's referring to that, you know, I've slept with cousins and uncles and brothers. Is he talking about when he was three? Well, or when he's talking about when he's a grown man? How many grown men hop in bed, like, not, I mean, sex, I mean, go to sleep in a bed multiple times and give, can give you a list of the number of other grown men they've gone to sleep in the yeah. same bed with? You know, it's yeah. crazy. It's well, absolutely crazy. Well, these guys are words when they say sexual relations. Mm -hmm. Well, I didn't mean groping or any other yeah, type yeah, of yeah. physical contact. You know, conjugal relations, that's what you only can have with a female anyway. So, no, I didn't have any sexual yeah, so relations. I'm celibate with because I'm not married. Right. Well, that's not really sort of what people mean in the common mm -hmm. speak of that no. word. So, yeah, it's very, it's extremely duplicitous. It's, again, you know, the, why, is a, why is a lie bad? Because it's a direct deception. Why is a deception or you know, you know, a way of wordsmithing bad? Because you've still achieved the same end. You've, deceived, you've deliberately deceived somebody if that person has a right to know the truth of something. Then you've deliberately deceived them. And, you know, a lie is just a different, more solid version of it. But all of this wordsmithing, well, I didn't know anything, and well, I can't quite remember, and it's all deceptive. That's the point. It's, it's, it's a way to avoid coming into contact with the truth. It doesn't really matter whether it's wordsmithing and carefully parsed phrases or an out and out lie. Uh, you know, lies obviously worse, but the point is it still arrives at the same place. We have the same condition now here going on with Pope Francis all mm -hmm. of a sudden that, oh well, you know, I, I can't remember what I can't remember. And yeah, yeah uh, you know, I think we're gonna show a piece of video we already did uh, where uh, Vigano, uh, Vigano walks up to Pope Francis in the, you know, the sort of general assembly of mm -hmm. all the uh, apostolic nuncios meeting him, and he begins to say something to him. Now the Vatican released video of that, and just as he begins to say something, the video goes to black. We watched that here in the studio, I'm like, Where, where's the rest of the video? Nobody got an answer to that. It's all of a sudden when he starts having this famous, you know, so what do you think of McCarrick? That video, that conversation is on tape. It's on video. The beginning of that, and then all of a sudden it just goes to black and nobody seems to know where it is or anything else. 
the conversation happened. Right. The mm -hmm. conversation happened the very beginning of it is there on right. video. Mm -hmm. And yet Pope Francis is like, well, I can't remember. I don't, I, don't know any, I don't know anything about McCarrick. No, no, I meant I don't know anything about Vigano saying anything about McCarrick, even though I asked him about McCarrick. Yeah, yeah. Astonishing lack of uh, memory and insight and knowledge uh, in the higher degree. Never seems to forget about immigrants, though. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Um, yeah, yeah uh, yesterday, Vatican News published excerpts from an interview with Pope Francis uh, in which he denied any knowledge of McCarrick's crimes. <clears throat> and this came just as the uh, the Figueredo report was released. And of course, uh, not surprisingly, church watchers were quick to note the uh, extraordinary timing of that coming on the same day as uh, these uh, revelations about McCarrick. Now, uh, among those who uh, noticed the timing was Vigano himself. He uh, yesterday accused Francis of lying, uh, pretty extraordinary, uh, said the Pope essentially was playing dumb to cover his tracks. Now, uh, Francis said this, quote, about McCarrick, I knew nothing, obviously nothing, nothing. I said it many times, I knew nothing, no idea. Okay. That's, uh, not, that's not true on the face of it. He right. has not said many times. Mm -hmm. He's never said at all, right. ever, Absolutely. that he knew about McCarrick. He's never answered so the question. That's his first lie. So his that's first right. lie is there. Secondly, if you notice, he doesn't say about <clears throat> Vigano. He says, mm -hmm. about McCarrick, mm -hmm. I knew mm -hmm. nothing. Right. The question right. was about McCarrick, right. which and, is key here. Right. right. And, and actually, he was responding to this Mexican journalist who said, okay, eight months ago, you said you would say nothing. Yes. Don't you think it's time to break your silence now? And that's mm -hmm. what he said in response to that. Mm -hmm. Yep, absolutely. Uh, yeah, and the silence was about Vigano's claims mm -hmm. that you knew. Mm -hmm. Yes, and he went on to say this. Uh, he said, I don't remember uh, if he, Vigano, told me about this, if it's true or not, no idea. But you know that about McCarrick, I knew nothing. If not, I wouldn't have remained quiet, right? right. Uh, again, just uh, very uh, <laughs> dubious uh, phrasing there, I think. And as you said, this was the first direct comment the Pope has made about uh, you know, McCarrick's serial sexual predation of sem seminarians and, uh, and minors. Uh, after the release of Vigano's initial testimony, he, yeah, he came out and he said, I will not say a single word about this. And, and he, up to now, he has made good on that, on that vow, although his cronies in the hierarchy and uh, established Catholic media have certainly certainly been vocal in, uh, in condemning Vigano. Uh, now, in, in response, as I said, in response to uh, the Pope's statement, Vigano came out, <clears throat> and uh, Vigano, by the way, remains in hiding out of fear of his life. Um, Vigano accused Francis of lying. He said this, quote, what the Pope said about not knowing anything is a lie. He pretends not to remember what I told him about McCarrick, and he pretends that it wasn't him who asked me about McCarrick in the first place. Now, recall that in his testimony, uh, Vigano recounted that uh, Francis approached him and asked, what do you think about McCarrick? It, it, basically fishing, deceptively uh, uh, testing Vigano to see where his loyalties uh, lay. And, you know, Vigano told him the truth. He told him that Vigano, uh, that, uh, McCarrick is indeed a predator, and Vigano you know, has been suffering the consequences of that ever since. Now, all this underscores, you know, what we've been saying, what what faithful Catholics throughout the church have been saying uh, for years that there, there's a toxic culture inside the church, uh, one bent on cover up, you know, protecting the institution over the innocent, and so forth. F uh, Figueredo himself spoke to this in his report uh, yesterday. He said this quote. <clears throat> It is clear that for, too, that, for, that for far too long, a culture has existed in the church that allowed those like McCarrick to continue their public activity after serious and even settled allegations had come to the attention of church leaders. Moreover, it is all too evident that cardinals, archbishops, and bishops in their cover-up until quite recently have enjoyed the propitious benefit of a more forgiving and lenient standard of evaluation as compared to those applied to lower-ranking clerics and religious. A double standard and non-independent accountability harm the credibility of church leadership and impede efforts to reestablish fundamental trust in the Catholic clergy. And well these said. No, oh, absolutely. Well yeah, said. yeah, that bullseye. Could have, that could have been a vortex. <laughs> <laughs> it really it was spot on. You know, in, in really sobering words, considering uh, you know Francis' recent <clears throat> motu proprio, you know his, his solution to the sex abuse crisis, effectively rubber stamping uh, the plan by Cardinals uh, Donald Whirl and Blaise Supich to allow the, the, uh, the bishops to, to self-police on, on abuse. Yeah, an important note that uh, Figueredo makes up front in his, on his site yesterday was that he was publishing the correspondence after having tried to discuss all of this with the Holy See since September of last mm -hmm. year. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Yeah. Eight months. And he, actually, nine months. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There was word out, too, that he was suffering from depression and starting to abuse alcohol and everything because of the conscience thing. Now it's cleared up because he's got everything out there. So. Yeah, you know, you're, I'm curious. I just said, I just, I made an, uh, an, you know, a, a brief moment there in the uh, open. Is there, I wonder if that motor proprio that came out was sort of like the last straw. Now, he'd already been working with him mm-hmm. since September, but he hadn't gone public. And I wonder if he, like so many of us, you know, we're just sitting there in Rome going, this is a complete farce. Mm-hmm. Every single person we were talking to was covering that. This, this entire thing is a complete farce. Even to some degree, you got the international journalists saying, uh, why should we trust you? Mm-hmm. McCarrick sat up here before. Why aren't you talking about seminarians? I mean, one question after another. Mm-hmm. Some of the most aggressive questioning I've ever seen in the Holy yes. See press office. Yeah. Uh, and you're sitting there going, well, and you know, of course they deflected the whole thing and you know, and, you know they, they run it through the, the sausage making machine, out comes the sausage of, the bishops will investigate themselves. Mm-hmm. And that was just, what, two weeks ago, I think, right? Mm -hmm. So I wonder if, uh, I mean, obviously when you read the, uh, you know, you look at CBS's account of the story, they didn't just get this yesterday, they released it yesterday. But if you back time, I'll bet you very close to the time that motor proprio came out until now, during that two weeks, both the the other Catholic web, or Catholic news website and the, and CBS were probably going over this because it's pretty bombshell charges. I mean, they're saying essentially the world's lying through his teeth, the Pope's lying through his teeth. So they're probably going through it being very, very, very meticulous and checking and doing forensic analysis on it, making sure this is in fact McCarrick's, one of the articles actually said that. Uh, so I'm wondering if that motu proprio was not sort of the trigger uh, for uh, the Monsignor to release those uh, to say that's it, I've had it. Well, figure this it stuff also needs to come out because that's a pretty clear statement. Right there. This is destroying the church. Yes. He also said he didn't want to be complicit. He didn't want to be part of those who are being named. The noose is tightening on Rico and that. He might have been one of the underlings thrown under the bus and all this. So, yeah, put the stuff out there. Yeah, it's going to be interesting. Well, so speaking of uh, you know getting thrown under the bus uh, and the noose is tightening on Rico, uh, perhaps Donald World's escape plan from the United States. He may have to pull the trigger on that yet. Yeah, the former Archbishop of Washington, Carl. Donald World always has remained steadfast in the fact that he knew nothing about McCarrick's past. He, of course, knew nothing about the restrictions. Well, this has all been torpedoed by these recent recent revelations. Basically, Vigano last August called out Cardinal World and said, well, he's lying shamelessly about not knowing anything of McCarrick. Now, along with the cache of documents released, letters released, there was also an interview released the same day in which uh, Figueredo was asked, well, what's the big deal? I mean, McCarrick's already been laicized here, and um, what, what's the big... And he comes out and he says, well, this is about who knew, which is the $52,000 question ever since the Summer of Shame. Let's take a listen. Well, I think it shows very clearly who did know what and when, and I think it shows very clearly that, in fact, McCarrick not only was not stopped, but in a real sense continued his activity to an ever greater degree. Yeah, so Cardinal Donald Worrell, he's quite a work, you know, from Archdiocese there. He basically came out through his spokesperson, uh, Ed McFadden, who told CNA all the way in last August that I knew nothing. Uh, says Cardinal World did not know, did not receive documentation or information from the Holy See specific to Cardinal McCarrick's behavior or any of the prohibitions in his life ministry suggested by Archbishop Vignell. Now, basically, right there, any of his past or the restrictions whatsoever. Now, these restrictions are even more important than the past because they contain all the past. The allegations, the multiple payouts from the diocese, all of that led up to the restrictions right there. So basically, let's focus just on the restrictions themselves. Monsignor Figueredo's report comes out here and says, quote, by stating that he had shared the letter with his Archbishop, McCarrick indicates that then Archbishop Whirl was aware of the letter and restrictions in 2008 and that a copy might exist in the archives of the Archdiocese of Washington. The next one, according to McCarrick, Archbishop Worrell is involved in the change of residence. We'll go into that in just a moment. Cardinal Ray and Cardinal Worrell appear to be directly involved in the implementation of the restrictions. Now, as uh, Christine mentioned earlier, there's a 2008 letter that McCarrick said, I shared with 
the Archbishop. In a, from 2005 on, that was world. This was in 2008. So that's what they're talking about. Change of residence was one of the restrictions. You can't travel freely. You uh, can't have um, sleeping with seminarians. That was a problem. Yeah, you can't so, do that. <laughs> so they, they, they moved him from the seminary in Washington where he was staying with the residents. And he was saying, well, the, the archbishop will arrange for me to stay in one of the other di uh, the parishes in the diocese. That was all contained in the Figueredo report. So now, in the face of all this, world still doubles down. Not saying I didn't just receive anything directly from the Holy See, but maybe through McCarrick or the Nuncio, but he has this to say. A life site reported yesterday there was an unnamed spokesman, we assume it was Ed McFadden, but it wasn't stated, quote, Cardinal Whirl has previously stated, and he reiterates it again, that he was not aware of any imposition of sanctions or restrictions related to any claim of abuse or inappropriate activity by Theodore McCarrick, end quote. That's a much broader statement than what was told yeah, yeah. by Ed McFadden to CNA earlier. Yes. There's, and there's no reason to believe it because he's already been caught in a lie mm -hmm. about claiming that he didn't know anything about McCarrick's sexual predation. For Father Robert Silek comes out, one of the victims says, he knew because I got the letter from you know the, our, the diocese at the time that he was head of that they got my letter and Whirl read it and sent it on to the Vatican. This was then, way back in 2004. He says he for, first he says he forgot about it, that particular yes. thing. And then he says, well, it wasn't directly in relationship to minors. It was actually about adults. Right, so and that's I what I was so answering. Really answer. And in that's, January, and that's 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 not I true forgot either. about that homosexual predation that I was named in a lawsuit that they told me about. Lapse, yeah, it had a problem. It. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, just lapse. to sum up here, Vigano <laughs> had this to say back in August when he talked about world lying shamelessly. Here's some more statements in the same testimony of August 22nd. The first who have been informed of the measures taken by Pope Benedict was McCarrick's successor in Washington, C, uh, C Cardinal Donald Worrell. I myself brought up the subject with Cardinal Worrell on several occasions, and I certainly didn't need to go into detail because it was immediately clear to me that he was fully aware of it, end quote. So, he's lying shamelessly. You have multiple witnesses here, Figueredo, you have Vigano being exonerated and all this, that he's, yes, co corroborated. Yeah, you even have McCarrick himself yes. saying, I told him. In writing, <laughs> the forensic, they did forensic analysis yeah. on these letters saying, yes, they did indeed come from McCarrick's computer, and this is his statements, these are yeah. verified. It just, it just makes me think these people must be pathological liars. Yes, I mean, we are. were talking about Father yeah, Robert Deland. they sociopaths to mm -hmm. lie it, on this we, kind of love. Exactly. Mm -hmm. I mean, we were talking about Father Robert Deland, you know, in the audio that was released. This yeah. man perjured himself on the stand in the first trial. He came right out and said, I didn't give any drugs to the victim. I didn't give any cigarettes. I didn't give any alcohol, even though there was objective evidence in the audio recordings, which we aired, where he is saying, here, cigarettes. Here's some cigarettes. Here, alcohol. Hey, here, you. ecstasy. Hey, you're high on ecstasy. He's like a <laughs> pathological liar. I can't, I mean, world strikes me as that. Well, that's what we're really oh, about sure, when yeah, yeah. Pope Francis says, well, I, I couldn't have known because I would have acted on it, right? That's kind, no, of, a, that's kind of a creepy <laughs> statement right yeah, there. Yeah, yeah the, and, and again, this isn't just a gotcha episode here. It's important for people to understand they have been caught in their lie, as you always are. You're yes. always caught in your lie. Sooner or later, one way or the other, however it happens, you're caught in your mm -hmm. lie. Thank God somebody has a, you know, a conscience in all of this. Uh, but now the moving forward is there's a man sitting in the seat that Whirl just stepped out of who is there because of Whirl. All that back and forth, these big high, you know, cardinalate seats always are, you know, no pope just goes, oh, I'm sticking Bob in there, and you know, the other guy that was there, I'm not taking your advice. World, we know, we know from eyewitness testimony in Rome, was back and forth in front of the pope multiple times from the time he had to step down but still remained administrator of DC until uh, 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 Wilton Gregory got named. We know that he was back and forth and back and forth, oftentimes with soupage. That man sitting there now, Wilton Gregory, is Whirl's man. Yeah. Whirl is a known liar who covered up everything about McCarrick as part, and a major part of the plot. And his man is sitting in his seat. That's why all of this is important. Not because it was just gotcha. I mean, that's, there's kind of a little bit of personal vindication stuff in there that we've been saying this all along. But all of that aside, it's really not important now one way or the other. Now you leave that stuff to God. 
this is what's important, mm -hmm. that the network has been, has been able to remain in place. Mm -hmm. That's what's important and significant mm -hmm. about this. And now the network has been exposed for what it is, and yet it remains. Yep. So now, no Catholic can sit around and say, oh, I didn't know anything, oh, well, oh really, is this not true? No, it's all there. It's, every bit of it is now out in the open. Including Catholic establishment media. They don't get to sit around saying, you know, oh, let's be moderate and reasonable. No, it's, it's their job to expose all of this corruption. Well, Austin and I, we were talking about this before the show, tweeted out the Watchful article that really emphasized the fact that the Pope said, well, I didn't really deny it, I just had a, a lapse yeah. of memory. No, no, no. So he says that's where those guys about are about McCarrick, read the quote. It's not a question about, do you, the question was not, did you remember what Vigano told you? The question was, did you know about McCarrick? And he says, uh, he says, a quote about McCarrick, I knew nothing. And I have said many times, I knew nothing. No, no you haven't said many times. Right. And the question was about McCarrick, and you answered it in the context of McCarrick. Yeah. You lied. You lied, yeah. Holy Father. You lied. And, and just as a reminder here, and we've showed this footage before, uh, this is not the Pope, first time Pope Francis has been caught in a lie. If you all mm -hmm. recall the case of Father Julio Grassi, who is a convicted, convicted pederast, you know, uh, imprisoned over um, his pederasty. Pope Francis, back when he was president of the bishops of Ar Ar Argentina, he authorized, he commissioned a, I think it was a two-year campaign or study to try to exonerate Father Grassi. He was in charge of that. That went on for years. There were hundreds of thousands of pages of documents trying to exonerate this priest who the court was unwilling to cave to that pressure. Just a few years ago, a journalist, and they got it on camera, a journalist asked Pope Francis, in St. Peter's Square, Pope Francis, did you have anything to do with this Julio Grassi case trying to exonerate him? He turns around and says, no, no, mm -hmm. total lie. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very disturbing. That wraps it for today. Stay close to Church Militant, your most reliable independent Catholic media, not owned and operated by the church establishment. So it means you can trust us and you'll get the truth from us and you'll get it straight. God love you.